Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been given the task of uh, pretty straightforward just being a professor, I guess, today to talk about how a treaty uh, becomes a treaty and gets ratified on that basis. So it's pretty dry, pretty straightforward, but I'd like to hear from the other gentlemen up here because they have been living this for a long while and they're going to get into, I think, some of the interesting topics. Maybe I can convince into that uh, later on. But uh, let me just say uh, to the people, that, the younger people that are here, I don't even think you have to raise your hand. We can pretty much identify you uh, <laughs> visually on that. Nothing uh, against my other gray-haired friends here, but uh, on that, it's two things have happened since the end of the so-called end of the Cold War. Uh, not only is there a generation being brought up that hasn't really focused on the, the nuclear issue, so to speak, but the generations that are older than that have sort of lost track of it. They thought it went away as an issue uh, after the end of this, the Cold War, the so-called end of the Cold War. And I find that even members of Congress now are unbelievably unaware mm -hmm. and ill-informed. And so we spent a lot of time at the Council for a Livable World reaching out to the public, trying to get to younger people, trying to get women and minorities involved in an issue that very much impacts them as well and take a leadership role, but also spending time lobbying on the Hill and educating on the Hill to members of Congress in the House and the Senate. And they really, unless they're on a committee of jurisdiction, the Armed Services Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee, maybe one of the oversight committees, they're so busy doing whatever it is they're doing, transportation or commerce or energy, education, they might not even have staff that deals very deeply with these issues. So there's a service that you all do when you go and talk to your member, and we hope to do on a regular basis, of bringing people up there. We brought Ernie Muniz up recently, talking about the Iran agreement and all the verification aspects to it that most members didn't even understand or appreciate. They didn't know the difference between the waiver provisions and the certification provisions, which are important to know. So we spent a lot of time doing that in... Uh, we need to keep doing it because it is not just young people coming along and saying, oh, you need to get informed of it. It is everybody across the board that has sort of fallen off the track. I don't think that many people in this country have an appreciation for what we're talking about when we're talking about a nuclear bomb. And Joe brought that up, of uh, uh, course, your talk. Most people are still thinking Hiroshima, Nagasaki, that size of bomb, and that if somebody has a nuclear war, a nuclear incident over there, wherever that might be, it's not really going to affect us. We are talking magnitudes of that and sometimes almost a thousand times larger than what was dropped in Japan. We use what was dropped in Japan to ignite the current weapons. Mm -hmm. They're just used as a tool to ignite what goes off. And if you go to Alex uh, Wellerstein's uh, website, I don't have the website with me, mm -hmm. you can actually pick your kilotonnage and pick you know, this place where you would drop a bomb will show you just the radius of damage. You know, the first wave of people just get incinerated, another wave where they get uh, injured and buildings fall down, another wave where radiation goes on, how long uh, this takes. If you have even what this president badly calls a limited nuclear war, which there is no such thing, all right, and this idea that it's never going to escalate, we're talking about annihilating the world. Right? And a good reading assignment for anybody in the room, if you haven't read it yet, is Dan Ellsberg's book mm -hmm. uh, that I just happened to finish reading last week, and I'm going to be with him next week, bringing him to about a dozen members of the House and Senate uh, so that he can talk about you know, this situation writ large. But his book, I thought, was pretty good. It's excellent, yeah, really, great. on that. Uh, and I was with James Carroll yesterday, coincidentally. He's just written a play about the Truman cabinet, who after J uh, the war with Japan, that cabinet had a real debate about whether we would take nuclear uh, knowledge and science and put it into the international community and have them have jurisdiction over it, or whether we would keep it. And of course, the keep it argument, one, you know, the Secretary of State at that time was paranoid about Russia, you know, and that won the argument of the day on, on that basis. But there were time, points along the way that we could have done a much better job, and there's so much more for us to know. But let me just get to the part about the treaty. It's relatively easy. Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution says that the uh, President shall have the power, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, to make treaties, providing that two-thirds of those President of the Senate vote to uh, concur. And so, but the process is a little more convoluted than that. Obviously, a president uh, decides whether he or she wants to get involved in a treaty, either to negotiate a new treaty, or they could talk about signing on to an existing treaty, although I doubt that, uh, given the politics of this country, anybody wants to be part of an agreement that they haven't helped construct. So we're probably talking about getting into negotiations on that basis. When that decision is made, the State Department then issues what they call a circular 175 uh, process, and they'll lay out what is... Uh, basically going to be the confines of what would be discussed in those negotiations, outlines all of the uh, issues that may be in there, and sends it off to Congress, uh, specifically the Senate. The lowlifes in the House don't get a chance to participate <laughs> in this, so when they say they send it to Congress, what they mean in that sense, they send it off to the Senate, 
informing them that these negotiations are going to take place. Uh, and then the Se Secretary of State and the Department of State, they keep this Congress informed as to what's going on during the process of the negotiations. And sometimes senators actually go and participate in the sense of being observers as the negotiations go on. That's been known to happen. Once the negotiations are completed, uh, the President signs the agreement and off it goes to the Senate. Uh, the President it may sign an agreement on that, but they also can make reservations, understandings, declarations, what they call RUDs on that. So they say they were signing this, this agreement, but here are my reservations or the understandings under which I do it or uh, some constraints on that. Send it off to the Senate. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee then decides that they're going to have hearings and briefings on it. For instance, New START had, I think, 20 classified and unclassified hearings and briefings on that and over 1,000 written questions for the record. You know, before the committee finally decided to make a recommendation out to the full Senate uh, on that, and it goes to the full Senate, and you actually, one of the few times you see a debate. Uh, and our own John Kerry uh, led the debate on the New Start process, that went in, and I think by most accounts did an excellent job. He was able to bat away all of the objections and concerns on that, uh, and then the vote was taken. But two-thirds of those senators that are present, of course, have to vote to accept that they can also, as a Senate, add their own uh, RUDs, you know, understandings or uh, agreements or constraints on that basis or whatever. When that's done, the, uh, the Senate then has a vote of cloture. They decide to close off debate. They bring it to the floor to see whether or not they can get the two-thirds that must vote for it uh, to do it and whether or not they'll have those conditions placed on it as well. They then take that vote to affirm or concur or not. It goes back to the, set, to the president, and it's the president who actually ratifies it. And the president ratifies it by sending it off to a depository which is an international institution usually where the treaty is maintained as those parties join. Maybe the UN, for one example on that, would be the depository on that. And then, depending on whether or not there's any legislation needed to comply with that, whether or not we have to change some uh, environmental regulations or other regulations, the Senate may have to pass other legislation on that basis to comport with that. That's it. That's the treaty from beginning to end. We don't see a lot of them now, unfortunately, because we have a party in power that's not inclined to want to agree about much of anything, uh, certainly not in the international circuit. And one of the dangers is that uh, even with respect to New Start, which is a no-brainer in terms of continuing on beyond 2021, we're worried that they're not going to take any action at all. Uh, the White House doesn't even have really the personnel in place to begin these conversations. Uh, and we have conferences coming up supposedly on a schedule with Russia and nobody to sit at the table and talk about extending that treaty. And if for nothing else, as Joseph said, for the very fact that the verifications that are involved in there are critical. We will never get another chance to have this kind of insight into Russia, nor they into us, you know, if we don't continue that or whatever. And it's one of the, the securities that you have is knowing at least where the other people are on that and moving forward. Uh, but we have a real obligation, in my mind, I think a lot of others, that we need to just move on. We have other treaties to do. We have an obligation under the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty to work towards reducing the arsenals of nuclear weapons, not just maintaining the status quo, not having new weapons, as this president proposes, uh, on his basis of tactical weapons and new types of uh, coming off of subs on that. And we're not meeting that obligation. So it is no wonder that over 120 countries in the international Spain had a declaration to rule uh, nuclear uh, weaponry possession illegal. All right, they're frustrated. They're beyond frustration on this point, and it should be understandable as to why that is. I think one of the disgraces is that this government decided to oppose it. And even if they didn't want to sign it or agree to become a party, I think they could have encouraged that kind of thinking and made a commitment to lead this world forward to the idea that we will continue under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to try and reduce the arsenals on that. This president says something to the effect, well, maybe someday uh, if something magical happens, we'll talk about reducing arsenals again. Well, the President of the United States should be the magician here. It's supposed to be the leader. It's supposed to have the wand to go out there to make that magic and make us move in that direction. We don't have that leadership now. We had some of it under President Obama. Some of us would have wished he went further, but at least he got it, and he knew where he wanted to go and where we should be going, and we've got to get back to that point. I'm done? I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.